Good morning, Life Church. Stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to connect with you. And an easy way to do that is to download the Life Church Emporia app from iTunes or Google Play and fill out the digital connection card where it says New Here. If you haven't been receiving our emails, Life Church, please let us know by emailing lifechurch at lifechurchemporia.com. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. We have a number of ways that you can connect this week and a great place to find that information is by checking the digital bulletin on the Life Church app. You can also find information about what's going on on our Facebook as well as our Instagram accounts. Stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Because you've been faithful, we've been able to continue to support ministries and missionaries at home and around the globe. If you'd like more information on giving, you can go to lifechurchemporia.com slash give. If you want to give through text, that number is 620-236-6789. If you've downloaded the app, you can find the information on giving on the give tile. And if you're in the building, you can find envelopes and buckets next to each door. If you have any questions about giving, please contact Sarah Jenick. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin.
timer went really fast today. Woo. Let's all stand together today. Jesus, we love you. Father God, we just invite you to come and have your way today. We are people that have need of you. Even if we don't think we do yet, we do. <laughs> we need you so much, Jesus. So come and have your way in this place. Have your way among your people. God, I pray that for this next few moments, and even beyond, God, that we would be able to set all of our cares, all of our worries aside and focus in on the greatness of you. Focus in on the honor that we have to worship you in freedom. To focus in on this time of being able to just glorify your mighty, mighty name. And God, I pray that, even for myself, God, I pray that I won't worry about tomorrow. Thank you, God, that, that that's something you tell us not to do. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. We trust you today, and we do. We invite you to come and move in this place. Move in our hearts. Move in our minds. Help us to be focused in on you. Help us to look to you. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
insecurity. Thank you that in you we get to have all the confidence. We get to stand on your faithfulness. We get to stand on your promises. Thank you, God, that we don't have to try to earn that. You didn't require that of us. You are good and you are faithful. I'm so grateful for that today. So today I want you to take a minute, think about what God has done in your life. You don't have to speak out loud. Just think about it. Think about how he's changed you. Think about what you've seen him do. Just for a few seconds.
let's tell him thank you. <laughs> thank you, God. Thank you, God. We love you today. We worship you today. Thank you for your goodness to us, your faithfulness to us. And all I'll do is praise. All I'll do is worship.
God, continue to speak life to those that are not walking as though they're living. Father God, continue to wake us up to what you would have for us, to your will and your way, to your plan. Continue to help us to set our plans and our thoughts and our things aside as we follow hard after you. Continue to remind us to turn our eyes to you when we begin to look at the world around. There is only one answer for us in this time, and that answer is you, Jesus. Keep our eyes on you. Keep our thoughts on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Jesus is the only way. you're here. I'm trying out for Crossing Guard this afternoon, so I wanted to make sure you didn't miss me. And uh, so anyway, I got this shirt early this summer, and so I thought, man, I might as well go ahead and wear it before it gets cold. How many of you know what I'm saying? I wanted to make sure you knew I wasn't a hologram, so, so we're not there. So Welcome, Life Church family. Glad you're here. So glad to be in the presence of God. And how many of you are thankful for Jesus and what he's done for us? Amen. So also, I want to just, man, I'm so glad that we have guests in the room. And I just want to just welcome them. Can we do that real quick? Just thank you for being here. Glad you're here. Um, this morning, as you turn to Romans 8... We're going to be looking at verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, and uh, there are, there's, a, there's few things that reflect the heart of God, the, the generosity of God, the, uh, the love of God, the benevolent heart of God, like adoption. In fact, uh, that's why we as a church, I just say this, um, support radical life in a preventative way, I mean, so that kids don't lose their parents. And that's also why we support Hope Fostered, like you saw with uh, Jason and Danica a couple weeks ago. And Psalm chapter 10, I, I just, I love this passage. Uh, I love the heart of it, especially in the message. It says this, 
Orphans get parents. The homeless get homes. I, I love that. One translation puts it this way. It says this. It's, he puts the fatherless in homes. It, it's, the, it's the heart of God. It's what God is doing. It's what God does. And so as we come to Romans 8, again, remember, we're coming to one of the, the greatest chapters of the Bible and all of God's Word. This morning, what might seem like obvious topics to talk about, you would not believe that when Paul writes the book of Romans that he would be addressing issues that we face even today. I look at this, and I mean, it's a chapter that begins with things like, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and then it ends with, nothing shall separate you from the love of God, but essentially in between that, it's a celebration of what the Holy Spirit does in the life of a believer. In fact, uh, we're, we're learning about what he does. And really, it, it becomes very important when you start looking at this for people who might have been raised in a Pentecostal church. Maybe you weren't raised in a Pentecostal background, but if you were, uh, some of us uh, have experienced things in the Pentecostal world. You might be aware of what I'm talking about when I say this, that many people who come from that background uh, only think of the Spirit's ministry in terms of baptism in the Holy Spirit. In other words, just that he makes you speak in some weird language, and boy, that's, you know, and so, so rather than realizing there are other things that the same Spirit of God is wanting to do in people, I mean, you start looking at it that there are things that he does that are relative to our salvation, that there are things that he does that should be viewed as primarily important in understanding, and sometimes even more than what might be perceived as some of the more flashy stuff, the, the spiritual gifts that tend to be turned on when the baptism of the Holy Spirit really is given. Listen, the, the Spirit of God has so much more to do with the person's salvation than what you might think. And so that's not, listen, that's not to take away from the spiritual gifts at all. That's to actually add to. But listen, it's the same Spirit of God who draws a person to Jesus Christ. How many of you are thankful that the Spirit of God worked in your life in such a way that He drew you when He drew you and how He drew you? How many of you are thankful for that? So, I mean, it, it, it's as if, uh, you know, as it is that it's the same Spirit of God that baptizes a, a person as is that brings a person and draws a person to Christ. And so what happens is, if a person doesn't realize that, if a person doesn't understand that, that God is wanting both and, not just either or, that, 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 the, that the Spirit of God is working in your salvation, then when you come to Romans 8, you might be a little confused. And so, listen, as, as you go through Romans 8, what you're going to see is the Spirit is doing some incredibly invaluable, life-giving, life-changing work, all, listen, all the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I must say this, if you're not in tune with the Spirit of God, you better get that way real quick, because I don't know if you see what's happening around us. I'm just saying that. It's not, that's not a political statement. I could care less about politics. That's not going to save anybody. I can tell you the only blood of Jesus Christ is going to save people. So I'm saying this this morning, all the ministry work of the Holy Spirit, and, and he's, doing in, he's doing things in the life of every single believer, if that person's really following him. So listen, as we're, as we're going through Romans 8, what we've seen is that the Spirit of God does so much in the life of a believer. In fact, one of the things that we saw was that he, you can see this list of things here, he changes our thinking. I mean, and then if that wasn't enough, he produces peace in us. How many of you have peace right now in the middle of crazy? Okay, I'm just saying, if you don't, we need to check, we need to check ourselves. So, and then he, listen, he dwells in us. He will, listen, he will resurrect us, ultimately making us more like Jesus. And so all of that to say, as a believer, is there proof of Holy Spirit's presence in your life? I mean, you may say, well, how do I know if he's working in my life? Well, uh, one of the things I, 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 I kind of ran across this this week um, as I was studying, and uh, th this person says this, he says, are you, are you defeating sin in your life? And if not, here's what you might need to consider. He says, how is your zeal for God? 
Ask yourself these questions. I mean, if you don't have that zeal for the Lord, I mean, has, has sin made you cold toward God? Has sin caused you to kind of like, you know, get your focus off of the Lord and, and onto other things? How much do you desire to worship and commune with God? I mean, the psalmist wrote this. He says, my eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Do you feel that way today? I say this, I mean, are you that passionate about not just seeing sin defeated in a culture, but are you, are you that passionate about seeing sin defeated in your own life? I mean, because that's a, that's a real question. Are you defeating sin in your life? And, well, how is your zeal for God? Number two, I want you to see this. How much do you love to pray and read the Bible? I think sometimes what happens is, is uh, we kind of look at it as something we forgot to do. How many of you, be, be honest with me. I want you to be honest. This is church. And if you're not honest, you know what's going to happen, right? So, I'm just saying. How many of you, there have been times where you're like, oh, man, I forgot. Anybody? Okay, all of the people that didn't raise your hand, just saying. You are perfect then, right? Okay, so, listen, I am not perfect. There's times when I forget. How many of you have ever, ever waited until you went to bed that you were going to, I'm going to spend time with the Lord, and so you waited until you went to bed? And then you were sitting there with your Bible, and you woke up with your face in your Bible, you know, <laughs> or on your iPad. It's great. It hurts more that way. But anyway, um, so listen, I mean, the Spirit of God is wanting to work in you. I mean, and, and, and listen, if the Spirit of God is not, the, the, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna dread reading your Bible, it's not going to be a joy to you. Can I tell you something? This thing has life in it. It has life. I mean, if it's not life to you, guess what? There's your sign, right? So, I mean, you, you're probably not defeating sin in your life. Number three, how much do you love being around God's people? I mean, spending time with other believers isn't, listen, I can, I can say this, because spending time with believers isn't just hanging out with people. I think sometimes we assume that or, or, you know, we like to, how many of you love to hang out with people that make you feel good? Can I tell you something? Not every person that makes me feel good is actually good for me. Because sometimes they're full of it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Anybody got some full of it friends? How many of you that are here and you can point at them? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. But you know, you know what I mean. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's way more to fellowship, godly fellowship than that. I mean, so there's actually something spiritual about being around brothers and sisters in Christ. And listen, marshmallows don't sharpen marshmallows. <laughs> iron sharpens iron, though. How many of you know what I mean? So, number four, how sensitive are you to sin? I mean, would you say like David? Zeal. Zeal for your house consumes me. Zeal for the things of God caused me to want to just like, hey man, I'm excited about what God's doing. It's exciting to know that God's work is, is, is working. I mean, how many of you know that God is drawing people, even this morning, he's drawing people right here in this room. He's drawing people out there. God is always speaking and talking to people. I mean, so do you grieve when there's sin in your own life or even when there's sin in somebody else's life? Or is it like, oh, well, I just, I just kind of knew. Oh, man. Anybody ever swallowed down the wrong hole? Sorry, it really did just happen. <laughs> uh, that's not, that's what, I've had one other time I had a fly strike, fly straight in my mouth in the middle of a, that was bad because it hit the back of the throat. And, you know, anyway. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, I mean, a lot of times what happens is we see somebody else uh, go through something and, we're like, well, I knew they were like that all day long. Listen, you're just reflecting what you're actually believing inside your own heart. So listen, again, if these things aren't there, chances are you're probably not saved. You're not walking with God. That's not me putting something on you that shouldn't be there. Listen, that's just looking at the scripture and saying, hey, these are things that are going to be part of what a believer really wants to be and wants to do. Because the Spirit of God is not working in your life to help you overcome sin. So listen, as we come to Romans 8, um, 14 through 17, there's another thing the Spirit of God does. 
Listen, he, he also, it, this is the coolest thing ever. He confirms our adoption. I mean, the, the Spirit of God, I mean, you can see it. He, he, he confirms our adoption. How, how do you and I know? Does anybody else have a knower? I have a knower. And there are things that I know way down deep in my knower. And I'm saying that that's a joke. I mean, I'm referring to the work of the Spirit in a person's life. I'm saying this. I mean, how do you and I know that we know that we know that we are children of God? Look at it in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Notice, sons of God, Adoption as sons, children of God. It becomes, it becomes very, very clear what Paul's saying as you study this. We, we're, we're adopted as children of God. Now, I want to I put this into a bigger context for just a second because when you, if you just take a scripture and just kind of pull it out and don't really get the full context, as you know, we've been saying there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are grateful for that? Amen? Why? Because you've been adopted. I mean, there, there's no condemnation. Why? Because we're his children. There's no condemnation. Why? Because you know what? Now, God is no longer our judge. If you go back to Romans 5, he's our father. I mean, so now before we look at that, I just have to say this because what you see is that our salvation, it's so amazing, it's so incredible that literally human words really honestly fail to describe what the enormity of what God has done, the wonder of it, the uh, generosity, if you will, of it. And so in order for us to kind of grasp our salvation and what it means, think of a multifaceted diamond. I thought you might want to see this. I mean, you start looking at the, all of the sides. There's different things that we learn about it as we read through Romans, or even as we read through the Bible itself. I mean, you can't go very far in the Bible before you learn that our salvation, uh, again, has so many sides. Uh, listen, our salvation is like an ark. I mean, just as the ark kept Noah and his family safe through a time of judgment, our salvation, listen, is an ark by which we escape eternal judgment. How many of you are thankful and grateful that we can listen to the words of Jesus and we can see it over and over again. Jesus compares our, our salvation to a celebration, to what shall I compare the kingdom, he says, you know, and Jesus says it's like a, a wedding feast. Our salvation can be pictured as the shepherd going after the lost sheep, Jesus said. I mean, forensically, we could look at our salvation and we could look at it in terms of Romans. Is God the judge finding a way to justify us as he declares us righteous based on not what you and I did, because our righteousness is his filthy rags, but it's based on what Jesus did. And so we've, we've learned about sanctification over the last few weeks. The Holy Spirit works in our salvation, making us like Jesus. So listen, there are doctrines, there are pictures, if you will, of our salvation, each designed to give us insight into what it does or what God does like this diamond because honestly, if it's greater than anything that we can ever comprehend. I mean, so listen, our salvation, it's great. How can I reject so great a salvation? I mean, how could I do that? I mean, maybe we never get to the point where we say, I, I, I pray this for us. I pray this for God's people. That we never get to the point where we say, oh, we're talking about salvation? Yeah, that's nice. But take me to the more deep stuff. There's nothing deeper than this. 
I mean, listen, while there are definitely other things in a believer's life that God does, especially as you grow and you mature, but listen, there is nothing as great as what he's done, not only for mankind, but to personalize it. There's not anything greater that he's done. I don't care if you've been healed from cancer. The bigger miracle was the fact that he actually saved you because you were a sinner on your way to hell. Think about that. So, and as we think of as we think of metaphors and pictures and uh, of salvation, probably the most gripping, the most powerful, the most amazing metaphor, really, of all metaphors, is to see our salvation as adoption. Now, think about this for a second. <laughs> this is, this is wow. The God of the universe. If you're walking with God, He adopted you the God of the universe adopted me I mean scriptures you see scriptures are everywhere about adoption I mean you could look at John chapter 1 verse 12 uh, those who receive him to them gave him the power that gave the he gave the power and the right to become the children of God we hear that and we're like, oh, I really don't think of it that way. But listen, that is very much contextually what he's talking about. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, I mean, talks about in love he predestined us to be son, his sons and his daughters. How many of you are grateful that he thought of you before anything ever, before time ever began, that he was, he was there thinking of you, paying attention to you, thinking about what you would be like, looking at you and thinking, you know what, it's going to be a great thing when that person comes into this world. 1 John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called, what? The children of God. I mean, now, listen, when, when the Bible says uh, we have become the adopted sons of God, it doesn't mean that somehow God picked us up off the street just to care for us. That's not what it means. And, and in fact, in Roman society, it was way different than it is in American culture. I know there's a lot of things about Roman culture that kind of reflect, and we get a lot of our law, um, you know, from that society, but adopted children, in many ways, were more honored than was a natural child. In fact, that to be adopted had a special privilege to it. It was literally, it was an honor to be adopted. And so, I think about this. You can't help who your mama and your daddy are. Now, some of you are like, what did he mean by that? Listen, I, I, you, it, when you were adopted, you weren't just born into a family. I mean, listen, you were chosen by that family. And this again, listen, it, it's a reminder, it's a wonderful reminder of salvation. I mean, that we become children of God by, by sovereign, divine choice. He, he, he chose you. He chose me. He chose us. I mean, if, if, you, if you understand that, listen, it, it's easier to understand in Romans chapter 8 how now there is therefore now no condemnation. That we'll, we'll never be condemned because, listen, he chose us. <laughs> he picked you. He, he's like, you know what I mean? How many of you have ever been the last kid on the field when you were getting picked for sports and it hurts your feelings? How many of you can raise your hand real high? How many of you want to get that person back right now? Okay, don't do that. So, um, but, you know, he, he chose you. I mean, we'll, we'll never be separated from the love of God because he chose us. If God be for us, then, well, I mean, who can be against us, right? Why is, why is God for us? Because he chose us. I mean, now, one of the things in Roman law regarding this idea of adoption, is, it was known as, and I want you to see this because it's, it's, it's detailed. There's, there's some detail here. I mean, you know, you look at uh, this idea, the idea that means, this word that means the father's power. What, what it did is it gave the father in the Roman family unit absolute power over his family. 
I mean, absolute power over his family, over his children. I mean, his children, listen, could be killed by his order without any penalty, without any recourse to him. I mean, if the father said, you live, you live. If the father said, you die, guess what? You died. And that absolute power of the father lasted the entire lifetime of the father. I mean, so a child never grew beyond that. It was lifelong. I mean, so obviously that makes the whole principle of adoption even more difficult as you look at their culture. Unless the child was an orphan, it was going to be very difficult to actually get this kid to be over uh, uh, in your family. Or maybe they were born into slavery and a slave not having any rights. Then I mean, any can, anything can be done with them. But listen, if a man saw a son, though, and that belonged to another father, and he wanted that son as his own, so maybe you have children or maybe you don't, um, but you see a, another son, and you think, wow, I would like to have him as a son. He would make a great son. Maybe that father didn't have a son, or maybe his sons weren't worthy. Maybe they were a mess, or maybe they weren't capable of managing his estate, and he needed somebody to be able to leave his estate to, and he would adopt another male as his son. Now, you might say, did that happen? It, it was quite common in the Roman Empire. I mean, you can look at it. In fact, if you remember uh, Roman emperors, how many of you remember Julius Caesar? Raise your hand real high if you know Julius Caesar. I mean, most of us in the room know that. Adopted Augustus Caesar. I mean, Augustus Caesar adopted Tiberius, and so Tiberius was not his son. I mean, Trajan uh, was adopted, and uh, Hadrian, Hadrian was adopted, Marcus Aurelius was adopted, and you could, you could name a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch more, but you should see my point. The Roman adoption, when that happened, followed two steps. And so we get our word from this first word, uh, yeah. Manicipatati patio. I'm just kidding. I like to say it southern just to keep your attention. So anyway, we get our word emancipation for it. And so it, it, what, what would happen is, is it was a symbolic sale that would be carried out and it had witnesses to it and I mean you would you would bring a scale and with some gold or some copper coins and then the father of the child to be adopted would act out selling on the sale his son and so then then what would happen is after, after he acted that out he would then act out buying back his son and then he would act out again selling his son and then he would uh, act out again, buying back his son. And, and on the third time, listen, on the third time it was very different. He sold his son without buying him back. And that meant, listen, his rights were symbolically severed, which led to the second step of adoption, and that's vindicatio. And in vindicatio, the, 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 the adopted father would then go to a Roman magistrate and he would present the, the case for legal adoption. And that adoption would be witnessed, William Barclay says, it would be a, a, a witnessed by seven people. I mention that because it's, it's very interesting that in the book of Revelation, the Holy Spirit is called the sevenfold spirit of God having to do with the number of completeness. I mean, so, so understand this, this process of adoption. So, th th listen, there were, there were consequences to adoption. There were things that happened as a result of adoption. Consequences not necessarily being a bad word. So I want you to see this. Three results of being adopted when you look at Roman society. The adopted person, the person who was being adopted, lost all ties to his old family. That means, listen, he, he lost all his rights to his old family, but listen, he gained all of the rights to the new family. Secondly, the adopted person became an heir to his new father. The adopted person became full heir uh, to his father's estate. And even if there were, listen, even if there were other sons, I mean, it didn't matter. He became the full heir to his new father's estate. And he didn't just share in the inheritance. Actually, listen, he got it all. Thirdly, the, adopted, the adopted person's past was forgiven. 
when, when this young man was adopted, all his legal debts were canceled. I mean, if, if there was a record of crime, it was expunged. I mean, it, it was as if the previous person had never existed before. And, and incidentally, the adoption didn't ha- only happen with children, though. It could ha- happen with children. Oftentimes, adults were adopted. But in the eyes of the law, I mean, it was as if the adopted person was literally and completely the son of the new father in every single way. Now, I want to take the remainder of our time to talk about this because how how the Holy Spirit confirms in our hearts the reality of our adoption, can I just tell you, that is huge. It is big for you as a person who's following Christ to realize that there is something down deep within you. Anybody else in this room, things happen in our world, difficulties happen, not just mass mandates and, and craziness, but how many of you have ever had something that would call, cause you to want to cry out to your Heavenly Father? That's built in. It's built in by the Holy Spirit of God. As beautiful of a concept as adoption is, rich in meaning, it is insufficient to explain all that happens to us when we become Christians because, listen, not only are we adopted, I mean, we could go down and we could look at it, I mean, we have been looking at it, but we are also regenerated. I mean, we're adopted, we're regenerated. Both of these concepts explain how God brings us to himself and, and as adopted people, uh, we are named sons of God and given title to an inheritance. But regeneration gives us the nature of sons and daughters. It makes us fit for our inheritance. So if adopted gives us the right, listen, regeneration gives us the actual ability to be able to be a part of God's kingdom. So let's look at it. I want to see this. Holy Spirit, how does Holy Spirit confirm? Holy Spirit confirms our, our hearts, the reality of our adoption, and he does it in three different ways. And I want you to see these this morning. First is this. I want you to see it's very simple this morning. Very concept and are very complex in what God did for us, but listen, it's uh, absolutely amazing and very simple. First of all, we are led by the Spirit. Let me ask you a question: Are you led by God's Spirit? I mean, for for all who are led by the Spirit of God, are sons of God. Maybe you're here and you say, "Well, why doesn't it say why doesn't it say children instead of sons?" And listen, why are you using the male? Why, why? Because listen, in that day, women could not receive anything. I say this because it's just the fact of the matter. I mean, they, they could not inherit anything. And, and while there is neither male, how many of you are thankful for there's neither male nor female in Christ Jesus in Galatians chapter 5? I mean, the imagery of adoption and integration requires that, or excuse me, not integration, but inheritance requires that whether you're a male or a female, it's all yours in Christ Jesus. Also notice this, if if you're saved, if you're really walking with Jesus, if you're really saved, His Spirit is leading you. Notice this word led. For all who are, everybody say it, led by the Spirit of God, right? They're sons of God. I mean, you see, you see this word used at different times. I mean, where in Luke's gospel we see it, I mean, it says Jesus was led by the Spirit. Where? Well, Jesus, Jesus was led by the Spirit out of the wilderness. Well, (laughs) Mark's gospel puts it this way. It's very interesting. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. I I say this because, in other words, there's there's a bit of a paradox when you start talking about the Spirit's moving. Listen, yes, yes, he is a gentleman because he will not force himself, but there's... There's such a power to who he is that when you and I are being led by him, it's as if he is moving us or it's as if he was leading us or pulling us or pushing us, if you will, guiding us, empowering us, if you will. Mark's gospel, driving us into the will of God. Does it, does it feel good to know that even though things are out of control right now in our country, that God's got this? And I'm not talking about the American dream, God's got this. I'm talking about the version of God's got this, that God's got this. You are in the palm of his hand. He loves you with an everlasting, undying love. He is willing to go there for you. Listen, but that doesn't mean we don't suffer. 
doesn't mean that we don't walk through difficulty. Can I just say this? I would love to stand up in here. Oh, yeah, we got prosperity in Jesus Christ. Woo! You know, I'd like to tell you that, but listen, the truth is, people who really stood for their faith were burnt at the stake. We don't, we don't like talking about the Fox's Book of Martyrs. So, can I tell you something? God is leading, but he also might be pushing, driving you into the will of God. Can I tell you that? That's not by mistake. Holy Spirit is working and he's active. You need to pay attention to what he's doing. Because if you don't, you're going to miss him. Don't miss God. I mean, oh, you might think, you know, you might think somehow you're just figuring it out on your own at times. But listen, you might think that at some times, but the Spirit of God is at work in you if you're a believer because you are his child. And listen, he is living in you and he is working through you and he is moving you into the will of God. Even sometimes when you don't even know he's doing that. So, can I just say this also? He need not be so worried about stuff. You need not be so worried about stuff. Am I saying there's no reason for concern? I'm not saying that at all. And what I am saying is, though, is that we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to be with us to go through the fire. And the truth is, is when he's with you, him plus anything is a winning team. Some of you need not be worried so much about stuff. You think you have a big decision to make? Certainly, seek God, trust God, listen, but trust that your Father who adopted you is leading you, that He is guiding you, that He is working in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, all because, listen, those who are led by the Spirit of God are also the sons of God. Now, listen, if that's all I needed to say today, boom, I could drop the mic, walk away, here, but here's more. You may say, well, how are we led? Yeah. Can I tell you something? The Spirit of God wants to direct your path by helping you. But He won't help you when you're not reading His Word. This manby pamby Christian stuff where we go, oh, I feel so much better after I come to church. Really? Because I'm up here preaching my guts out telling you you're going to hell. And <laughs> I'm just saying, I mean, welcome to Life Church. Die to yourself. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I'm not, I, some of you that are maybe new to this church, I, that's part of that's joking, but some parts of it are real because, listen, we're up here, we're not preaching a Mamie Pamby gospel, we're preaching a, a, a gospel that's full of truth. I'm not saying that because it's me, I'm saying it because, man, the Spirit checks me in the middle of the week. The Spirit of God is working in the middle of the week. He's working this morning. Yes, he's drawing people to himself. He's doing that all the time. But listen, a Christian, the Spirit of God wants to direct your path by helping you understand God's word. Can I just say today's cultural Christian who really isn't saved, listen, they probably fell away because of this issue. The Spirit directs our path by helping us understand God's word. But listen, he can't illuminate what it is that you're not reading. It's like asking God to bring back to remembrance all the things that, on the test, but you didn't study for it. Lord, help me to bring back to remembrance those things that I didn't study. Do you want me to like have a creative memory or what, you know? Yes, God can do miracles, and I've had him work miracles in my life. But listen, God wants to illuminate the truth to you. Listen, anyone can read the Bible, but not everyone can have illumination in their heart. Another way we're led by the Spirit is sanctification. Holy Spirit assists us in applying what we've learned. I mean, and he not only illuminates the word in our minds, but listen, he stirs our hearts. He stirs our will. How many of you can attest to this, that, that there has been a moment where God led you to do something, and you knew that you knew that you knew that you knew that it was God, and it, it proved to be that God was working in you later on. How many of you can raise your hand to that? I mean, I say this because, I mean, the truth is, is I mean, he leads us through illumination, but he also leads us through sanctification the idea of sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like jesus here's the deal can i tell you something it's probably like jesus 
if it's death to you and life to somebody else. It's probably Jesus. It's probably not Jesus if you say, hey, you know what? Uh, the Lord has convicted me about something, Tom. And then I tell you something. I'm just saying. Like the truth is, is I know God's speaking when God is convicting me and he tells me, die to yourself, Tony. Yeah, I don't want to do that, Jesus. Tell me something for somebody else to make them die, not me die. You know? I, I say this because the truth is, I mean, the Spirit of God is working. Listen, and let me just say, when a person doesn't walk in obedience, not reading the Word of God, not living out the process of sanctification, neither will they receive confirmation of their salvation from the Spirit. What do you mean, Tony? I'm saying this. You will not know that you are adopted by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What? Right. Holy Spirit confirms that in people who really do come to Christ. I don't care if you prayed the prayer or you didn't pray the prayer. Listen, it has nothing to do with just a prayer. Listen, it has everything to do with what the Spirit does when the, the activity of God is present in a person's life to the point where they say, you know what, I am going to give my life to Jesus because I can't do it any other way. It's death to myself. So, amen, Pastor Tony, preach it. So, by the way, I'm not talking about the confirmation class. I'm not talking about maybe you went through confirmation or a class. I'm talking about, listen, I'm talking about real confirmation from Holy Spirit. The confirmation that the Spirit's work does when we actually are submitting ourselves to his leading. Listen, when you do not submit to his leading, the natural flow of that is you're going you're to doubt your salvation. You're not going to walk in that salvation. And so to the, to the far Pentecostal right folks, maybe not just in the room, but maybe even watching today who would say, you know, well, I just follow the Spirit. Well, it depends on what you mean because sometimes what that means is, well, what I really want to do is they're just kind of a wild hair. Okay? Well, I follow the Spirit. I don't follow anybody. I don't follow, I don't follow the pastor. I don't follow. Okay, there's a problem right there. I'm not saying because it's me. I'm just saying, how many of you know the Bible talks about submitting to our leaders and, and, and their authority? How many of you know that? That's not me standing up here telling you, submit to my authority. That's not me doing that right now. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not, that's not what I'm doing here. But understand, we're talking about if somebody's sitting there saying the Spirit of God told me to do something, well, it depends on what we're talking about. Because if it's something that's not in the Bible, there's a problem. Can I just say that? Uh, man, pastoring is hard sometimes. The Spirit of God asked me to leave my wife for another, for another woman. Yeah, that's clear in the Bible. Okay, so you know what I'm saying? The, the, the Spirit of God isn't going to ask you to go against the, the Word of God. Just so you know, that wasn't the Spirit. That was a Spirit, but it wasn't the Spirit. Okay, probably demonic. And just so you know, they were talking to you. That should scare you. Maybe you should confirm your spirit promptings from Scripture. Well, going to preach this morning. So anyway, sorry. You can delete that part later. There's a second way Holy Spirit confirms the reality of our adoption. And that's this. We're freed by the Spirit. Now, we like this word because we think sometimes freedom means, well, I can do whatever I want. Because I want what I want, and I like what I want. So I want some chocolate cake. Just give me some cake right now. That's what we think. But listen, the, when he frees you by the Spirit, what does he free us from? Fear. Listen. He replaces fear with freedom. And the reason is because before you, before you came to Christ, can I just tell you something? You were under wrath. You were under the wrath of God. You were facing condemnation. God was against you. What? Pastor Tony said God was against me before you came to Christ. All of us are. And the reason is it's because of our sin. We were facing judgment. I mean, if, you're, if you've not given your heart to Jesus, let me just be very clear this morning. The reason you are here is so that you might realize that a day of judgment is coming and that you might run to Jesus and be saved from your sin. 
and to flee the coming judgment. That's not me standing here on the corner and holding up a sign. Listen, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 5, listen, that, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body's been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus is like, unless you're born again, I mean, very, be very, very afraid. I mean, but listen, once, you're, once you fear God in a healthy way and you come to Jesus, you don't have to fear him anymore. That's why if you've not yet been saved, listen, today is the day of your salvation. I mean, there's no need to run and hide anymore. You don't have to do that like Adam and Eve in the garden. You don't have to do that. People have been doing that ever since, by the way. They'll do it in the book of Revelation someday. Hiding from God's wrath, hiding behind rocks, hiding in caves, hiding in holes in the ground. And the crazy part about that all is that God is actually making the earth shake. So why would you want to go in a hole in the ground? It's a bad idea. And they're saying, save us from the wrath of the Lamb. Maybe you're here and you think, well, I won't run. I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, you will be. Believe me, you will. You cannot take that. You cannot, you're not, people will want to die, but they can't. But when you know him and he's redeemed you, you're no longer afraid of him. You've gone, with, you've gone away from being afraid to saying, Dad, Daddy, Papa, Abba. I mean, look at verse 15 here. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. When God redeemed you, it changed everything. First and foremost, it changed. You're no longer under wrath, but under grace. And you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry out, Daddy. Notice this is the spirit of adoption. Because he's, he is the witness. Listen, I, I, I take you back. Some of the information that I gave you earlier was not about trying to give you facts and trying to impress you. It was about, listen, it has everything to do with what we're talking about right now in this verse. Because he is the witness to our adoption. He was the one who saw our adoption. He is the one who was there for our adoption. He was the one who was the active part of the Godhead, changing us into a different person he saw it he was there he was active now i want you to see there's a third way the holy spirit affirms the reality of our adoption in christ and that's this we're confirmed by the spirit look at it in verse 16 it says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god so here's what happens the spirit of god tells somebody when they're a christian that they are a Christian. I mean, here's sometimes what happens. I mean, by well-meaning people, sometimes you'll have people who will be dogmatic about praying people. Can I tell you something? Do you know that I've prayed with people before and they said the prayer, but nothing really took? You know why that was? Because of these verses. I'm saying this, only God can change a heart. I mean, you can pray a prayer all day long, but... Unless God changes your heart, unless he gives you faith to believe, man. Listen, I mean, we can get dogmatic about it sometimes. We can say, well, you know what? I mean, well, we're going to pray with people, and if you confess your mouth with Jesus' mouth and say those, say those words, I mean, you know, listen, praying with people who, who've never prayed is one thing, and per, but pronouncing that person just because they said the words, did you pray? I mean, did you repent? Did you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life? I mean, did you? Well, then you've just got to accept it, man. Listen, I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. And the reason I say that is because, listen, if that's all there is, I disagree with that. And let me explain why. Because if somebody s- says in that process that they don't have the witness of the Spirit, which happens sometimes, can I tell you it's not your job to be the witness? Only Holy Spirit can do that. So the idea, you know, don't pronounce somebody saved just because they prayed the prayer. There's there's nothing wrong 
with showing them and teaching them the truth. Listen, understand this, and that's why we have grow. That's why we have the I have decided table back here. That's why we have people that are following up with people and that there really has been. We want to know, has there really been a transformation there that, that they are a Christian? So the proof of that is, is when a person is regenerated, guess what's going to happen? There is going to be a change. And the Spirit, big S, Holy Spirit, bears witness with your and my spirit, small s, that we are children of God. I mean, if you read the stories of great men and women who went through the process of salvation, I, I don't have time to read them, but there were some people who went through a season of what they call travail, a season of God doing a work in their life that brings them to that place of confirmation in the Spirit. And what can be hurtful at times is when someone, is, someone goes to give someone a false sense of assurance too quickly and by simply stating that, well, you jumped through the hoop, so Jesus is Lord of your life, right? Whether it be in the Lutheran world of jumping through the hoops of confirmation class or whether it be, you know, you prayed this and you prayed that and, or, or even more, maybe even it was you prayed a prayer at Life Church. I mean, listen, I'm saying this when in fact there may need to be a time of walking through that reckoning. And yes, today is the day of salvation, but if the Spirit of God, if that person hasn't worked that out and they don't see the depth of their sin yet, that God is working in that person to bring about a repentance in their life and there is going to be a transforming at some point, but it, it's not yet. It's going to happen in His timing. But you and I, listen, we got to get out of his way. Not try to get them to pray a prayer so we can feel better. And what it can amount to if we're not careful is we do a disservice if we try to be the ones to give the assurance instead of allowing God to be the one to give that assurance. Listen, we, <laughs> can I just tell you, we need the Spirit of God active in our lives more than ever before. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, look at it. The Spirit himself bears with us with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, what does it say? Then heirs. I don't know about you. I don't know if you know this or not. But Abba, Father, is, an, is a very endearing Aramaic term. Jesus spoke Aramaic in his day. And for us, that would be like saying daddy. It would be like saying papa. I mentioned that before. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up and I had something happen, there were certain things that only mom could fix. Like for instance, one time I jumped over a chair, caught my arm on a hook and ripped my arm wide open real good. And you know, dad was standing over here, mom was over here. I didn't need dad to tell me, why did you do that? I needed my mom to say, oh, my poor baby. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Pa parents, I know there's parental role. You have to remember that God, we look at God and very careful about this, and we use the word he as the pronoun, but listen, I'm just telling you, uh, there's both sides of God in male and female. You start looking at that, and listen, uh, but they, a kid wants a parent. And if, I, and if I didn't want my mom just to feel sorry for me, or if I didn't want her to actually come kiss my boo-boo, you know what I mean? If it was serious enough, and I wasn't going to be calling out for the doctor... I mean, and I wasn't going to be calling, you know, some of my friends come and help or some professional counselor to come. I didn't even think of that. I didn't even know what that was then. Or, or some person I didn't know. I mean, rather, there were some things that I wanted my dad to deal with. I'm in real big trouble, Dad. This kid won't leave me alone. Oh, yeah, he will. <laughs> and so let, let me help you when it comes to God himself. Maybe for some of you, I don't know everyone's situation here. I know most of you in here, but maybe for you, a father wasn't the greatest thing. But can I tell you something? He is our father in the very kindest way possible. He's not some distant deity, he's our heavenly father. And listen, he, he chooses you. And he's choosing you because, listen, 
he thinks you'll honor his name. He's choosing you because he knows they'll probably manage the estate. He's choosing you because he thinks, not that you're worthless, but he thinks, you know, you're worthwhile. I mean, he's not choosing you because he thinks, oh, they're going to fail. You know, listen, how many of you failed this week? How many of you failed last week, the week before? Anybody fail? Listen, anybody had to repent this week? I'm just saying. He's not choosing you because he thinks you're going to fail. He's choosing you because he thinks you'll be faithful. I'm not talking about in your own strength and your own power, but through him. He's not choosing you because you're like some charity hardcore case. I mean, listen, a hardship case. He's, he's choosing you because he says, I see in them my divine purpose. By my spirit working in them, I have a future for them. And so the spirit leads us. The spirit frees us. The spirit confirms us. And you are the heir. Listen, can I just say this? You are the heir to an amazing fortune and to unbelievable riches and treasures in Christ Jesus. I'm not talking about, woohoo, we got gold and we got silver. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about all his wealth is yours and he's blessed you with it can somebody how many of you have your bible in here this morning i want you to hold it up i know some of you have <laughs> listen do you realize what he's blessed you with indescribable treasure and when you pick up your bible that's like the letter from not just some unknown uncle who has a lot of money. It's even better. He's the best father ever. And he, can I just say this? He left you all things. For what? For life and for godliness. Because he owns it all. And you're his adopted child. And the estate letter, listen, it's your Bible. And the Spirit of God is like, the Spirit of God's like the mailman. You got a letter. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> you got a really good letter. Just wait and see what it is that you inherit. Galatians 4, 7. God has made you his heir. He's left you a package. And let's close with this. 1 Peter 1, 4. The musicians make their way back up. We have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure, undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Can I tell you something? No moth's going to mess with your inheritance. No moths are going to mess it up. No house fire can mess up this inheritance. Nothing can break into it and steal this inheritance. It's priceless. And listen, it's not going to decay and it's not going to change. It's not going to go down with the money markets. Listen, what am I inheriting? God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. What's in the inheritance? Everything. Because remember in Romans, we're, we're joint heirs with Jesus. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. He gave everything to the Son, and when he adopted you, you have all rights as if you're the full heir. Some of you need to hear this today. You're rich beyond your wildest imagination. Yeah, Pastor Tony, but it ain't money. Okay, when you get to heaven, if you go to heaven, it's not just riches and gold and silver we're going to be interested in. Just real frankly, that's why you should be generous. I'm, I'm saying this because it's really not ours to begin with, but I think it's even more than that. What if the gift of the inheritance is not, it's not just some gift what if the inheritance, the actual giver himself? Listen, Psalm chapter 73, verse 25 and 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. 
Anybody feeling that way these days? Yeah, I'm feeling that more and more. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. And listen, what is he? He's my portion forever. What, what makes heaven, heaven? Listen, it's not streets of gold, not pearly gates. It's not all those things, not swimming in a mountain of gold coins. Ooh, hey. What will make heaven, heaven is the nearness, the closeness, and the proximity of God to his people. In the fact, in the end, we get this picture of what is going to, what it's going to be like in heaven. And John tells us some things about heaven, and he says it in Revelation 21. He says, he, that's God, will dwell with them, that's us, and they will be his people, and God himself will, what? Be with them as their God. God will be with them. And really, it's a picture of you and me emerging from a difficult world where brokenness and hardships reign supreme. That's what this world is. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to let go of it. Where I'm saying this because devilish mandates from antichrist spirits ruled from hell, that's what this life is about. You may say, what? I thought life was, he was here to give me life and give it to me more abundantly. Listen, clearly we don't have the definition of life in America. God wants you to be close to him. If he has to use difficulty to do it, he'll do it. But listen, there's going to be a day when you fall past that point where it's like, you cross over from death to life. <laughs> and someday when we fall into the Father's arms, we will never get over the closeness that we have with God the Father. I'm so sorry. He will hold you and he will be close to you. And you will have that for all of eternity. And listen, where your treasure is there, your heart is also. This morning as we bow our heads and close our eyes, there are those this morning you're here, maybe you're online. Listen, maybe you're very, very afraid. You're filled with fear and rightly so. Listen, God is against all sin. And part of the fear is because you realize that not only do you have not have the peace of God, but you also don't have peace with God. You realize you need him. And he's drawing you nearer to him. This morning, he's wooing you to that relationship with him. Where he brings you out of that life of fear, into that place of freedom. That place of shelter, that place of safety in him with him where you're led by spirit you're free from fear and that, that spirit the spirit brings confirmation that know so inside of your heart that when he confirms you you know that you know that you know that you know that you're on your way to heaven that you are in right relationship with God why? Romans says he justifies us not based upon our own righteousness. I mean, our righteousness is this dirty menstrual cloth. It's, it's messed up. He's justified you. He wants to make you right with him. And the punishment for sin is wrath. God placed his wrath on Jesus instead of on you. Jesus took your place and was treated like you deserve. And because of that, God now treats you like Jesus deserved. That's what he wants to do. All because he saw you as an object of his affection. 
He loves you with an everlasting love this morning. And so he gives you faith to believe. You're worried about that? God will give you that this morning, making you a child of God. And it causes you to want to cry out to your father. Your old father, yes, was the devil and tried to trick you. But listen, your new father, he's the best father ever. And today you can realize your need for him today. And he's wanting to save you and set you free. He wants to adopt you, bringing you into the family of God, setting your feet upon the solid rock. That's you this morning. You're within the sound of my voice right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed this morning. You just say, that's me. I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I realize that I've fallen from him. I've fallen away from him. Maybe you've been a believer before and you fell away. This morning you're here and you'd say, you know what? I need the King of kings and the Lord of lords in my life. You're here and you'd say, that's me. doesn't matter how many times you've been to church. You're not adopted right now and you want to be. Jesus, thank you, God. something right now. I want us, you can look at me. Um, I, I just really sense more and more that God's people, we need to be close to him. And I, I know that what, I know sometimes what that means for preachers that, you know, um, make the sermon longer, make whatever long. I know that. I understand that. But please hear me this morning. Not everything that can be done in your spiritual life is going to be done on a Sunday morning. Can I say that? Is that okay to say? I hope, I hope not, because if that's the case, that means we're just Sunday morning Christians. Because God is always working. God's working all the time. So listen, I'm saying this. We need to pra- be practicing the presence of God more than any other time in our lives. And if, listen, if you haven't figured this out yet, How much control do you really think you have? Can I can I can I just ask that question? How much control do you really think we have? We have a perception of of us being in control. The problem is, is there's no way for us to look ahead and see the future. I I got news for you. As for me and my house, we're sticking close to Jesus, is all I know. And I I mean I want the Spirit of God and the presence of God in our home. That's what, that's what we have to have, right? So this morning, I want to do something this morning. I, I, I want those who want to come down here, want to spend time with the Lord. I know there's a Chiefs games at, at 225, but if that's your main goal, you got problems, okay? I'm just going to say. So the Spirit of God wants to do a work in people's lives. And I can't do that for him. Will you respond? Will you say, hey, you know, I need, again, again, the altar area is a place for you to come and be alone with the Lord. Maybe you can be alone at your seat with the Lord. I, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for not coming down the front. It's not, that's not what this is about. This is about experiencing the presence of the Lord and allowing him to do things in our hearts and in our lives that only he can do. And when he's speaking, here's the deal. When he's showing us things, listen, maybe he might tell you something that's very valuable for this next week. I have no idea. For this next month, maybe for this next year, I have no idea. The Spirit of God wants to speak to our hearts, wants to show us who he is and how real he is. And he wants us to to rest in him sometimes we get going at breakneck speed and we we don't realize man we need the presence of god in our lives to slow down and say you know what time with him is more valuable than some than some of this other stuff i've been putting on myself so i want us to do this right now i'm going to open this up we're going to sing these songs we're going to play some i just i just encourage you to come down go ahead and stand with me right now we're going to sing if you have to go please don't Please don't get caught up in feeling like, oh man, Pastor Tony, I don't want to interrupt his service. That's, you're not interrupting me. Please don't feel that way. If you need to go, you need to go. But just come and hang out with the Lord this morning. Come and spend time in his presence. Maybe find a place at your seat this morning. He's real. He's good.
days, Jesus, I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. For all my days, Jesus, I am Oh 
close to your heart. May I be a pure reflection of all you are. Love that is patient. Love that is kind. A love that keeps no offenses or wrongs of mine. Make me like Jesus. Make me like Jesus. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. Faithful to find Right where I am, oh, oh, even in my wandering, you call me friend. Your mercy receives me, lifts me to my feet, and I'm caught up in the wonder and the mystery of knowing Jesus. space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open. Do whatever you to do say whatever you want to say move however you want to move and change whatever you want to change so do Whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say, move however you want to move, and change whatever you want to change. I invite you to change. Whatever you want to change in my life, Lord, change whatever you want to change. My heart is an open space for you to come and have your way. I'm open. I'm open.
the joy of knowing you.
Thank you. 